So moving along, so let's talk about um, some definitions, okay? So there are primary processes from photochemistry. So that's where products are formed directly from the excited state of a reactant, okay? So we consider the very first step in any photochemical reaction is A plus H nu. So, right, remember that's symbol for photon, H nu, okay? Goes to A star, so excited state, okay? So in any photochemical process, this is the first step. The molecule has to absorb a photon. Uh, and it happens really, really insanely fast. 10 to the minus 16 seconds. So that's roughly 100 atto seconds, okay? Atto. Um, one atto second is 10 to the minus 18. And did you know that the, actually the fastest man-made event in human history is a laser that can be fired at pulses roughly every 70 atto seconds. Someone at Berkeley was able to do that. Of course, it was Berkeley. Um, and it's the fastest human event ever done. A laser that can fire every 7 times 10 to the minus 16 seconds. Crazy fast. So this is not going to be the rate limiting step. It's super duper fast, okay? So primary processes are products formed directly from the excited state of a reactant. So that would be now this excited state goes on to form products, okay? So secondary processes are products that are formed from intermediates that are formed directly from the excited state of a reactant. So for example, in secondary photochemistry, a star might form some intermediate and then that intermediate goes on to form a stable product, okay? And so we, we classify these processes, or we, I should say, we quantify them by the quantum yield phi. So this definition is number of excited molecules proceeding by process I divided by the total number of photons absorbed, okay? So there's a couple different ways to, we could think about that. So for example, if I have, um, suppose uh, A absorbs 100 photons, or rather I should say, suppose I irradiate A with 100 photons, okay? And perhaps maybe only one of those photons leads into doing photochemistry. So in other words, one out of those 100 photons went on to make an excited state which then went on to make products, that would be a quantum yield of 1%, right? One out of 100 photons, okay? Um, so then suppose, you know, so what happens to the other photons? Well, suppose some of them lead into the molecule undergoing fluorescence or phosphorescence or intersystems crossings or all of those lovely things you learn about in a Jablonski diagram. Um, I think mostly you learned that in Chem 441, I know some of you haven't taken that class yet. We will do Jablonski diagrams uh, agnosium in Chem 362. So you're going to see Jablonski diagrams again. Um, so another way we can think of phi in terms of kinetics, there's another definition, and that would be the rate of a specific process, okay, divided by the intensity, uh, intensity, of light absorbed, okay? So um, often these things are pretty difficult to calculate. We usually rely on um, people determining quantum yields for us, okay? So and I'm gonna show you a couple more things that can happen with quantum yield, okay? So mechanisms of decay of excited states, all right? So the first thing we can say is, so I'll talk, I'll use the letter S to describe a singlet state, okay? So we talked about this briefly, but just to remind you, a singlet state is an electron pair, singlet. A triplet state 
is an unpaired set of electrons. And actually, I think in the last lecture, I forgot to describe the doublet state. And the doublet state is just one single unpaired electron. And it's called a doublet because it could be spin up or it could be spin down. Okay. Um, so I don't have a periodic table in front of me, but um, a sodium metal, for example, is a good um, sodium metal, right? It's got a two, uh, 2s1 electron configuration. That's a doublet. Okay. So let's just talk about an arbitrary singlet state, a molecule possessing a pair of electrons. Okay. If we irradiate it with H nu, and I'm going to say H nu initial, it could go into some excited state. And we call that absorbance. That's crazy fast. We often don't even consider the rate of that step. Okay. And now um, we see the decay. So another possibility okay, is this excited state could decay just back down to the ground state and emit light as a result at some different frequency. And we call that fluorescence. Okay. And I'll say that happens with rate constant KF. And here, this is fluorescence because the product H nu I is greater in energy than the product H nu F. So it's fluorescence, right? You have to use a more energetic photon for the absorbance, um, like a UV photon, for example, and it will give off um, a visible photon, like a blue photon. Okay, so that's called fluorescence. So another thing that could happen, of course, is our excited state could just decay back down to a ground state. Um, we call that internal conversion, internal conversion. And that happens at, uh, I'll say that's rate constant K I C. Okay. Or our singlet excited state could actually convert into a triplet excited state. And that's called intersystems crossing. I'll call that I S C intersystems crossing. Um, and as it turns out, that is very slow. It's very slow because it's very unlikely that a, a singlet state, right, a pair of electrons will just decide it's going to flip. All the same, it can still happen, okay? And so now if we think of the lifetime of an excited singlet state, and by the way, all of these are first order. All of these are first order exponential decays. So all of their rate constants are one over seconds. So the lifetime of an excited state we can give by tau, okay? And that's just going to be 1 over k, right? Because these are first order reactions. So the lifetime is just 1 over k. However, if we think of the total lifetime of our excited state, it's really going to be 1 over k fluorescence plus 1 over k uh, inner systems crossing plus one over K, uh, oh, internal conversion, inner systems crossing. Okay. Um, you know, another one that I didn't define either, we'll put it on right here. My singlet state could decay into a triplet state. Um, and then that triplet state, sorry, let me, uh, describe this as, uh, a ground state triplet state. And as a result, it would have to give off light, just like in this case, we call that um, phosphorescence, okay? I'll say that's K-pH. Um, that's also very slow, but all the same, it's a possibility, so we could put that on there, okay? So if we think about our total lifetime, so if we think about now um, going down the pipeline, right? I blast some light at a molecule, it absorbs that light. These are all of the things that it could go through, right? All of those energies could go funneling down the pipeline until we're just back to our normal ground state. 
Um, and the lifetime of that process would be 1 over all of those rate constants. Okay? But for example, suppose we wanted to know the quantum yield of perhaps fluorescence, just as an example. Okay? So then my quantum yield of fluorescence would be K fluorescence divided by K fluorescence plus K internal conversion plus K inter-systems crossing plus K phosphorescence. So we could talk about the quantum yield of any one of these processes by looking at its individual rate constant divided by the total rate constants. All right? Okay, so, um, and you notice that this doesn't have anything to do within the chemistry that can then go on um, from that excited state, right? It's just how long does that excited state live? And as it turns out, right, we didn't even talk about the absorbance. It's so fast it doesn't even play a role in there, okay? So as it turns out, the, um, the fluorescence channels and the interconversion channels, intersystem uh, internal conversion, excuse me, those will go very fast and those will dominate the decay of an excited state. So intersystems crossing and phosphorescence might not even occur because the fluorescence or the inter internal conversion um, might just take all of your excited states back down to the ground state.